Arkansas. Where's that? So when the alarm goes off, um, that's, I'm sick of that sound, to be honest. Uh, when the alarm goes off, everybody just runs and responds as best they can. You need a high staff presence in a PACU because you don't know what you're going to stumble upon. You don't know what you're running into. All in a day's work, I suppose. Morning, Sally. How are you feeling this morning? Not too bad. You're not too bad? You didn't. You slept OK? No. <laughs> Can I do wee blood pressure? Is that OK? Yeah. I initially didn't want to be become a nurse because, one, I did not think I was smart enough, and two, I thought I was too emotional. Your what, Pat? It's not bad. Your blood pressure? No, it's actually quite good. It didn't drop high yesterday. Was it? Well, probably you're a wee bit stressed yesterday being in casualty. <laughs> I'd be the same. And it wasn't until actually I was looking after my granny who got diagnosed with dementia in quite an early stage of her life. Then she said to me one day that I would make a really lovely nurse. We got your teeth out, yeah. Very short. Very tender. Which yeah. side was it, darling? That wee side there. Yeah. Can you just open up? I applied for Queen's and it just all went into motion. And I remember telling Granny that I'd got into nursing. I remember her bawling her eyes out and I just knew, yes, this was the right decision. You don't take milk. You don't take milk? No. Why do you eat Rice Krispies dry? <laughs> no, I can you see I would have the orange juice on it. Wait, are you telling me you take orange juice in your Rice Krispies? And we can't take it. You take it in? OK, right, I'll have to go. <laughs> That's something new, haven't heard that one. You take porridge. I take porridge. I realised that I just, it, I could literally do this for the rest of my life. Morning, Mary. How are you this morning, Pat? Not too bad. When Granny passed away then, I remember just seeing the nurse holding her hand and the nurse turned around and she's like, I just didn't want her to be alone. It made me realise I could be that person holding someone's hand in the most vulnerable situation. Because I'm on two great tablets a day, one in the morning, one at night. It might be a different one, though. Uh. So they might have tried you on that one and they realised it might not work as such. So, at least that's good. I know that she would be very proud of me for wanting to be that person. Uh-huh, we have to check the dates on all of these to make sure they're all in dates. That's what takes us so long. <laughs> Our day-to-day -day on stroke and rehab consists of a lot of working with our patients on a personal level because their mobility is very much decreased. So we're basically doing nearly the basic needs for them, like brushing their teeth, brushing their hair, helping them get washed, walking them to the bathroom, as well as then doing all of our medical stuff as well. There wouldn't be a lot of like high case medical problems happening, but you're literally coming out there physically drained and also like mentally drained. So my alarm just went off. I have to go give a critical medication. Um, I have two gentlemen that are on Matapar and this is a generic name for a Parkinson's medication that they have to be given a very strict regimental times during the day. So I've set my alarm on my phone. So the moment that goes off, I know I need to give it within like 15 minutes. It is initially being a newly qualified nurse, very daunting because now everything to do with this patient is on your shoulders. And even sometimes they're talking to another medical professional trying to get your point across to advocate for your patients, like, no, you need to come and see them. No, you need to do this. It can be challenging because you are being grilled. And especially when you're newly qualified, you don't know, like, oh, maybe am I wrong to do this? So you have to sort of make yourself confident. <laughs> Just it's like, no, I am right. This is, I need you to do this. Hello, Pat. How are you? Hi, Not too bad. Can I, do you want me to apply this wee balm to your lips? Are your lips a wee bit dry? Please. Yeah, I'll get a wee pair of gloves on, OK? On our ward, we really do get to know our patients. And then once they eventually, like, get discharged, you're so happy for them, especially if they've gotten back to baseline where they can be more independent and they're doing so much more for themselves. It is so great. And you're 
lot. It just makes me so happy. The amount of times I've cried with patients as they've, they're going out and they're just like, don't cry. And I'm just like, just don't come back to see me. You're not allowed to come back onto this ward. I love you, but don't come back. Okay, you come with me. How are you doing? Not too bad. <laughs> what have you done to yourself? Well, I fell over. Okay. Yes, the wall. But the part of the road either, I'm just going to do Scott. Okay. When did it happen? This morning. I did my training through St George's Hospital in Tooting in London, and one of my placements was an emergency department over there. So I always had a passion for nursing and a passion for e ED. You gave yourself a good old whack, didn't you? I did indeed. Put that arm down there. Grand. I'm going to have a look and see what your medication you're on. So this lady has been out in the ambulance for a couple of hours before I've actually got to see her. She's waiting just over two and a quarter hours to come in. Unfortunately, it's just the, the pressures on space that we have in the, the emergency department at the moment that we've not been able to get her in. Unless your injury or condition is limb or life-threatening, there will be inevitable delays, uh, either in the back of an ambulance or in a waiting room. So this is just local anaesthetic, okay. I'm gonna put it into the wound itself. Can be a wee bit stingy. Well done. Well, I don't mind. You're doing really well. Certainly more trolley weights now and more pressure on space than there ever has been in the departments. Um, this isn't unique to us. This is felt across our emergency colleagues across the whole of Northern Ireland. The pressures never go away. Um, we just deal with it on a patient by patient basis and make sure we try and give the best care we can to everybody we see. It's a good enough cut you've got going on here. <laughs> so I've worked in different emergency departments for the past 23 years. I've always enjoyed the pace and the variety that emergency nursing brings. Um, I've progressed through different careers in the emergency department, from a staff nurse to a minor injuries practitioner to a, now an advanced nurse practitioner, dealing with anything really that comes into the emergency department and anything that's thrown at us. Um, it's, uh, it comes just with practice and experience. So... <laughs> it's the same with anything, I suppose. You, you learn how to do it on, on models almost. Yeah. Or pigs trotters is very good. And then practice makes perfect, I would think. I can't do socks though. Not bad for my first day. <laughs> so suturing and um, wound closure is probably a skill that ED nurses historically have done as part of their daily workload. Um, we always used to practice on people who'd fallen over on a Friday evening. And you used to suit your heads back together again. Um, <laughs> it's probably one of the skills that separates ED nurses away from nurses in other wards or other areas. Can't see the stitch. Sutured the, the fatty tissue just underneath the skin back together again and then brought the skin on the top back together just with a few loose stitches just to keep it in place. Gonna pop it out a wee dressing on now um, and let nature heal it on yourself. The role of the ANP is a fairly new role. It's come about due to shortages on the medical rotor. Um, we work as senior nurses, but we also work as senior clinicians within the department, um, enabling us to see whatever patient presents in the ED, not just minor injuries or minor ailments. Um, we see and assess patients with psychiatric illnesses, chest pains, abdominal pains, as well as patients who come in with trauma. How long do I keep that on for? Well, we'll keep it on for a few days. That wee silicon dressing is designed to stay on for up to a week. Oh, oh well, that's all right. But what day is it today? Today's Wednesday. We'll ask the district nurses to come and have a look at you probably towards the end of this week okay. or beginning of yes. next to see when they can get out to you. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Thank you. How's that for you, Peggy? That's good. That's wonderful. I thought it was going to be worse. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I'm going to have to send these boys home. <laughs>
You can do that all day. How's that going to go He doesn't have a key. Ah, that's a good lad. Patients in the psychiatric intensive care unit are detained under the mental health order, and a large part of the time it's against our will. So you're already facing that sort of difficulty of patients not wanting to be there. It means there's a higher level of resistance. There will be an element where something's going to happen that's going to boil over. Um, and you have to be comfortable in that sort of environment at times because when you know something bad is going to happen, you have to be constantly vigilant but respond calmly. And that can be quite tough because you're actually conflicting with two different sort of behavioural states yourself. Well, growing up, I would say there's very little experience with mental health. It wasn't something that was probably widely recognised going through school. What I did have was a wealth of experience and sort of lived experience with a brother with a learning disability. Also equipped me with the knowledge to care and the love of someone who's living in a society which is not fundamentally set up to accommodate them. It's like five, four staff in that office and none of them's doing anything. It's all doing work. Like what, Stan talking to each other? Do you understand? You've been yeah, here, you've been here numerous times, you've seen the way it is. I've seen it Yeah. We've well, understaffed. Staff. Staff. Staff's don't need to go on with the work, right? Now, what's the plan? Do you have a bank card that I could use? I'm going to print out yeah. a wee slip. You're going to sign it. Mm. Grant me access to go down and get your cigarettes. No bar, no bar, no bar. Patients can direct their aggression um, towards objects, doors, staff, even fellow patients. Um, in that instance, you know, we had a patient who just didn't have any cigarettes. Here's your meds, right, bud? So, your dose is coming in the evening. What, see them, them grey ones, where they're, where they're in three now? Right. Yeah, that's the dose, because there's only them tablets. So you're on. First thing in the morning, we come in and we get the medication started. Lovely. How much do we have? Three cold ones and then a bit of a source one. Routine is massively important. Know that it's half eight in the morning, breakfast time, medication time. Your math, there's 225s. At times here, it can be overlooked because you're trying to stabilise somebody's mental state, but a large part of that is the structure. He doesn't want to be here. Sometimes, maybe with the offering of medication, there's that direct refusal. Um, that also comes with a limited amount of insight. They can't see into their mental health illness. But that gives us enough time to maybe work with them to explain why they need to take their medications, the rationale behind medications, and allows us to get that sort of therapeutic relationship building, to get that rapport, and to get that trust. I need to take your medication, it gets you out of here. And I know you want to get out of here, don't you? I know, I know. Well, the tablets are helping you, you just don't know it. The tablets help you in other ways. Okay, help the head. All right, happy to remain very much settled. This gentleman, in this particular case, has been well for so long. His biggest issue was probably leaving the contained area and he was getting a bit fearful and paranoid. By offering the medication and reframing it as this medication will help you reduce paranoia, and the safety of this environment will keep you happy and content to take his medications, taking what he's thinking on board, understanding where his concerns are actually resonating from, and not meeting it with a power struggle, not meeting it with any sort of argumentative language, but also being firm and keeping consistent throughout. It meant that he took his medication for us in the end. The thought process will be a wee bit clearer, and hopefully that will go a good way in helping him today. A lot of our patients are at different stages of their journeys here, and that's what makes the job so difficult, but so worthwhile too, because you're consistently adapting to what you see, and you're constantly altering your, what way you work, your rapport with each individual patient. And with that, it's actually quite wearing at times too. You know, you do come home and you feel a lot of, you don't feel physically tired, but you feel mentally tired and mentally fatigued. There is that narrative of mental health that it's all medication, that you are pushing medication, but it's not. A large part of being a psychiatric nurse, and especially working in a psychiatric intensive care unit where there's heightened levels of aggression, is understand that maybe aggression and unpredictability is a form of communication. Whether it be punching walls or trying to attempt to hit staff. Sometimes medication you can't really reduce that, but maybe a talk to therapy might. The days are normally quite routine and structured. We would give pass to patients that are concordant with their treatment and doing very well. And that would just be taking them out maybe for appointments, um, getting them over to the shop, and even doing things like having a haircut. Um, right, give me two seconds. Nine to ten quarter. That's it, that's it, that's it, yeah. It's nine to ten. He's all right? Yeah, all good. It's all right. All right, hold on. 
No worries. Sometimes hard to know where to go, where you, where you can end up. Um, lucky enough, it was a false alarm. Oh, get your heart rate up, any any time you hear that alarm. Throughout my whole nursing career, I've only known the normal as the COVID restrictions, the COVID regulations. It only started within the middle of my second year that we all had to wear the masks. So it sort of became my normal. Our ward has been hit a couple of times with a COVID outbreak. And in those situations, we go from wearing our normal amber masks to our full red PPE, full visors, full red masks that we have to get fit tested for. And then everything in our ward just goes into shutdown. Literally, they are so raw, like so many dry patches on my skin at the moment. That's all I got for Christmas was hand cream. <laughs> I think that's what all nurses It's get. just constant cleaning, trying to communicate with our patients through these really hard masks. And it just, everything is just heightened to a new degree. Our patients, their anxiety's up, our anxiety's up, because that stops a lot of things for our patients. It stops a lot of like their appointments, a lot of their stuff that could potentially get them home. And it's just, it just makes everything 10 times harder. When they do see us all in the red PPE, and especially with ones with dementia, with delirium, it just confuses them even more. It makes them more scared. I've came home with scars on my arms, bruises on my chest, which is not the patient's fault. It never is, but it's, it doesn't mean that it doesn't scare you. You have to lateral flow every single day, and it's actually became, came out as a recommendation for us to do two PCR tests a week, which is very difficult. It's our arrest alarm, so we all run to that end station to help out as much as we can. When any normal alarm goes off, do not run. The only one that you run to is that one, because that is the most important one to go off. Nobody uses good news. Um, <laughs> she's away in the villa, um, so last 24 hours. Before I even started nursing, I knew there was a shortage in staff. It wasn't until I actually started my placements as a student nurse that you saw the reality of what shortage of staff did to a ward. Okay, and I don't know There is a lot of pressure. You don't see it until you're out there witnessing that. You're like, oh, it is scary. You can understand why people leave the job. Um, due to just stress related because we're so understaffed or sometimes people just go into agency, you can understand why they're doing that. But you just have to put the big girl panties on and keep going, basically. Yes, hello, Noel, it's um, Victoria again. I got, you know the way I was looking for an ambulance tomorrow, that's fine, but I've got, um, can I do an appointment for Tuesday? Perfect, thank you. Getting transport is probably one of the hardest things because our ambulance crews are so stretched out at the moment just with everything. It is so hard to try and get patients home. And a lot of the time then, if we can't get an ambulance booked or family can't bring them home just because they physically can't, a lot of time that delay is discharged. And then that's just so disappointing for the patient, especially when you tell them that morning, oh, you're getting discharged. And they're like, yay. And they're like, not today though. Has to be tomorrow. Can't get you transport. It frustrates me so much. I'm hoping, fingers crossed, we get to a more normal state. You know you're on a restricted fluid. <laughs> Sometimes I think you deliberately try to, like, give me a heart attack. For all of you who are graduating today from the School of Nursing and Midwifery, this is a day like no other. I actually started working as a full-time nurse in September time, but I didn't have my graduation until December. So by this stage, a lot of us are already sort of working as our band fours. And then once we get our pin, our band fives, and then we have our graduation. So it's quite like a drawn out process, but officially this was me walking out of Queens, fully qualified in my gown with my certificate. It was great. Victoria McTurk.
my little granny charm. It's just so nice just to know that she's here with me today. I'm just so excited. It's all over. I've like officially done it. It's like I've got certificates and everything that shows that I've done it. I'm finally like a nurse. Everybody here is a nurse and I'm so happy for everybody. Glad I didn't fall across the stage and just so excited just to celebrate, especially once my family comes up, we'll go out, have food and just enjoy this great time that we have been like waiting for for so long. When did the swelling start? That started, uh, I would say, about four, five <laughs> weeks. But this in here has only appeared, you know, and it's quite painful when okay. you touch it. That wedding ring is on 64 mm -hmm. years, and it's coming off the day. <laughs> <laughs> you have to cut that off, I think. As so long as, like, you you go as far as the ring, like, and we'll take it off. I won't cut your finger off. Not just yet, anyway. My ring always fit up well, and then it started to swell. And then the doctor says, it's been there a long time. I says, yes, 64 years. And uh, I says, although he died at 44, he died quite young, I thought. But the ring never come off, so it's been there ever since. So we, uh, we have a laugh about that. He says, see the next one, make sure it's a nice broad one. And that was <laughs> OK, you slip your finger out, if you can. Now, look at that. Now I got married all those years ago. There's all the gold dust. Mm -hmm. That's my tip for the day. So I, I'll put this somewhere safe for you. Oh, thank you very much. I'll and put it in here for you so it's safe. And don't worry, there's nothing in it. <laughs> well, there, there is now. Thank you very much. I'm looking at Annie's finger x-rays here. Um, this is Annie's ring finger. A lot of soft tissue swelling. The joint surfaces are okay. The swelling doesn't extend down into the bone itself. Um, we just look at it from another view here. Again, a lot of soft tissue swelling. Just gonna wait for her blood results to come back. Um, she probably has a bit of gout in her fingers. Annie, what we'll do is we'll get a sideboard and then we'll just transfer you from this one onto our stretcher, all right? You're going a sideboard? Slideboard. A slideboard. Yeah, so don't have to do anything, all right? We've got you back. Gout was always seen as a disease of the 17th century, an opulent lifestyle. You don't have to be a red wine drinking, port supping, a red meat eater. It affects lots of people. Gout is a rheumatoid condition. Um, that affects the, the body's ability to uh, process uric acid. And so our treatment for, for Annie this morning will be to give her some anti-inflammatory cream just to rub onto her hands, um, and I will ask her GP to check her bloods in a couple of weeks' time to see how she's getting on. Yes, sir. Yeah. And your ring's in your purse, in, your, in the thing. And your ring's in the purse, and I'm definitely going to get a fix in. You took it over. No problem. Well, take it easy, darling. Bye, guys. Uh, I managed to find a, a space to bring my patient in so I can do a wee scan of his abdomen. Um, and obviously, it's, it's one patient in and one patient out at the moment. So, as this lady leaves, I'm going to nab the space before anybody else does. Left of him, to his left. We're trying to look for, for his aorta, which is the big blood vessel, um, which is to see the. Can you see on the screen in front of me here? Um, so um, that, that scan's perfectly normal. So what, we're, what we're looking for is looking at the big blood vessel. Yours is perfectly normal. So I'm just waiting for the last of your blood results to come back. I'm going to check those now um, and come up with a wee plan for you in a second. The pressures across Northern Ireland on the health service have never been felt so much after coming out of the pandemic. The pressures seem to manifest in the emergency department. We do try and see the patients with time sensitive injuries and illnesses first, strokes, heart attacks, patients with acute mental health crises, other patients who attend the emergency departments, there usually will be some wait for them. However, we, we try and treat each patient equally and with the respect that I won't want my family to get if they come into the emergency department. You've got your blood results back there. Um, 
your, your kidneys aren't working as well as they should be and we need to investigate that for you. Um, but you'll probably be staying in hospital today, get the, get the surgical doctors to come and see you. You feeling okay? Just t tired and shaky. Yeah. Do you want to pop your legs up on the bed here? Have we maybe get a doze or something? Do you want a wee blanket? No, that's fine. Come on, I'll come back to you shortly. It's when in the emergency department um, our emergency call bell goes off. We know that somebody needs help uh, urgently. When we assess the patient, we all allocate roles to ourselves. So somebody will be allocated to airway, breathing, circulation, um, drugs, and any other equipment that's needed. Can we have some nice masks as well? So we've just been called to a lady who was found in a cubicle, um, collapsed. And we've had to assess her very quickly, um, uh, support her breathing. She's actually a patient who's been here waiting for a bed under the medical team. Um, so we've assessed her, given her some emergency treatment. There is no other space at the moment in the ED. We've had to move her into our paediatric resuscitation area as it's the only space that we can give her the critical care support that she needs. And there was a child actually being assessed there. The child was moved out to a torridor, really, um, so we could get the acutely unwell lady in there so we can give her the life-saving treatment that she needed. We need the medical team to call. OK? We have to respond to emergencies as they happen in the department. We'd like to see everybody in their own individual room, but unfortunately, um, as the pressures on the department grow uh, and the amount of attendances grow throughout the day, we have to use every available space to the best of our ability. Can I do that if you need to do that now? No, no, you're okay. I'm here all okay. okay. Okay? Yeah. I'll just go She's probably going to need um, ventilatory support um, with, a, with a tight-fitting mask over the next day or so um, to help her, help her breathing. I'm going to go on to the next patient. Um, I've got a couple of people still waiting to be seen. Um, and I need to finish off my assessment of a patient I was, I was in the middle of. My ward, I just, I love it because it's just, it's just my home away from home now. I feel a lot of pride being part of the NHS. I am very proud to wear my blues. You're still going to see this face when I'm like 80, I tell you now. <laughs> You are working with patients at the most acutely disturbed phase of their mental illness. And it's where you can directly see the care that you're providing. I'm very lucky that I do this job where I can just sort of be myself. The nature of emergency work means that we do see some particularly upsetting scenes. Sometimes the work does spill over into home time. Um, and how we deal with that is how you get back on the horse and come back in the next day. You know, we, we do speak to our, our our well, wives or husbands. Um, we give the kids an extra hard squeeze. We go to the golf course and try and hit a golf ball as hard as you can. We try to do what we can to leave work at work. And if we can do that with a nice cold beer or a glass of wine, then sometimes all the better. Come take me down to that place I love. Summer shining bright as the stars above Come take me down to that place I love